Hi, Dr. Bredesen, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? We can, thank great. you. Great, and can you see the slides all right? We see your slides just great. I know you're uh, uh, pulling them all up after the, the Fantastic. slides. Fantastic, there we go. All right, thank well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, very exciting stuff. I think this is a really interesting time because we are seeing, as I'll show you today, reversals in patients with cognitive decline, something that uh, has been a goal for many, many years and which hasn't been described before. We published the first results back in 2014, and we've actually just finished the first trial. And I'll talk a little bit about the trial uh, with very exciting results. So for the first time, we can not only prevent, but also reverse cognitive decline. Okay. So uh, the problem here has been that um, there is, a, we've all been through this pandemic uh, over the last uh, year plus, uh, but just for comparison here, the, there we go, COVID-19 has, has killed uh, over 500,000 people. Uh, but for comparison, Alzheimer's of the currently living Americans, those of us living today, uh, Alzheimer's will lead to the death in nearly a hundred times. About 45 million of the currently living Americans will die from Alzheimer's disease if we don't develop an effective prevention and treatment. So this is a major, major issue. And so the problem is that COVID-19 is a simple disease. So just like pneumococcal pneumonia, we know what causes it. There's an organism. We can develop antivirals for it. We can develop improvements for our immune system. We can develop all sorts of ways to go at this because we have it sequenced. We know what it is. Yes, it's still a pandemic. Yes, it's still a problem. But fundamentally, Alzheimer's is quite different. There is no agreement on what Alzheimer's actually is in terms of the cause. Is this due to a virus? Is this due to a change in your immune system? Is this due to so-called type three diabetes? Is this a prion disease? Is this a disease due to amyloid, due to misfolded proteins? And so there has been pretty much uniform failure in going after this disease and over 400 failed clinical trials at a cost of billions of dollars. So this is the issue that we've been wrestling with for 30 years now in the laboratory. The goal of our laboratory over the last 30 years has been to understand the phenomenon of neurodegeneration at a fundamental enough level that we can begin to, to fashion the first effective treatments. And that's been the problem. There have been over 150,000 papers published on Alzheimer's disease. We've actually published over 200 ourselves. Uh, and yet there hasn't been a general understanding of what's actually doing this. And therefore there hasn't been a good ability to predict therapeutic success and failure accurately. So people have gone off and spent billions on these trials that have been virtually uniform failures. And here's why. So I think as everyone's aware here, there is a real revolution going on in medicine. I mean, that is the real truth. That's the exciting part. If you look at simple diseases, and these are the things that were killing us 100 years ago, things like tuberculosis, pneumococcal pneumonia, diphtheria, things like that, then they share one thing in common. That is to say that there are lots of things that can increase your risk, but there's one thing that's by far more important than anything else. So let's look at pneumococcal pneumonia as a simple example. You have an increased risk for pneumococcal pneumonia if you have alcohol on board, if you've got diabetes mellitus, if you've got B cell problems. So for example, people with multiple myeloma, and there are many other things that increase your risk for getting pneumococcal pneumonia, airway changes, all sorts of things, previous damage to your lungs, things like that. But the pneumococcus itself is so much more important. It outstrips everything so much that we as physicians have gotten away with treating this illness just by targeting one thing, which in this case, of course, is the pneumococcus. So whether it's with amoxicillin or penicillin or cephalosporins or what have you, we're able to cure the vast majority of people who have pneumococcal pneumonia just by targeting that one thing. The problem is now in the 21st century, virtually all of us are dying from fundamentally different diseases. These are complex chronic illnesses, Alzheimer's, cancers, cardiovascular disease, renal failure, other inflammatory diseases, and so forth and so on. 
And the problem with these diseases is that you can see here, taking Alzheimer's as an example, insulin resistance here is one of the things that's critical. Pathogens, very common. Uh, for example, herpes simplex from the lip, uh, T. denticola or P. gingivalis from the oral microbiome. There, and there are other organisms, chronic mold exposure from sinuses, for example, Borrelia systemically, and on and on. So all of these are potentially important in increasing risk for Alzheimer's disease. NF-kappa B, so anything that activates the inflammatory state, be it leaky gut, be it exposure to specific pathogens, be it exposure to things that you're hypersensitive to, anything that increases that molecule, NF-kappa B, actually increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease. And then various toxins, uh, for example, mercury. So people who have mercury exposure are at increased risk. And in fact, you can actually show that in, in the laboratory that just taking mercury itself will induce the same changes in the brain that you see with Alzheimer's, the same amyloid, the same tau. So mercury, another one. And then mycotoxins, people who are exposed to these mold-produced toxins and other biotoxins have an increased risk for cognitive decline of Alzheimer's disease. And then people who are exposed to organic toxins, people, things like, uh, things like um, benzene, toluene, glyphosate, all of these things increase risk. And then people who have high homocysteine, so people who are poor methylators, for example, or who are poor in their overall consumption of B12, uh, folate, and pyridoxine, all of these increase. And then there are many other players here. But you can see here that unlike with a simple disease like pneumococcal pneumonia, there's not one of these that we can go after with a simple prescription and then we'll cure the whole thing. And this has been the problem. And so people have go, tried to go after Alzheimer's with these simple prescriptions and it simply has not worked. So this is a fundamentally different type of illness. We need to take a precision protocol approach. We need to evaluate these various variables with each patient. And then we need to target the ones that are suboptimal for each person. And as I'll show you, that's exactly what has worked. So if you look then at the drug development over the last several years, it's really been a very sad story. We call this Game of Thrones because they've thrown away a tremendous amount of money to develop these drugs that actually haven't worked particularly well. So this is a, the area of greatest biomedical therapeutic failure. As people say, everyone knows a cancer survivor, no one knows an Alzheimer's survivor or an ALS survivor or a frontotemporal dementia survivor. So this area of neurodegeneration has been the area of greatest biomedical therapeutic failure. And if you just look at a few of these, uh, here you can see, for example, semigasostat is an example where Eli Lilly spent over $500 million developing and testing semigasostat. Um, this affected uh, gamma secretase in, in the production of A-beta. And unfortunately, not only did semigasostat not make Alzheimer's better, it actually made it worse. So it was worse than doing nothing. So this is, you know, again, when this, these sorts of things are happening, there's something missing from the understanding of this disease. Here's another one, Dimabon. It failed the first trial and then they didn't believe it and said, well, wait a minute, we're gonna try it again. It was then tried with Aricept. And in fact, the two of them together also did not work. So again, there's something fundamentally wrong when we have billions of dollars spent in over 400 failed trials.